Swirling City Symphony sits superbly on sight and sound's special summation of cinema. This is Man with a Movie Camera. There's no other way to start this episode. I don't think so. I it's don't think so. It's impossible to come up with a logline. I think that's going to do it for us. Let's do it. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hey. <laughs> Welcome to Seen and Heard. This is the podcast where two entertainment assistants talk about the sight and sound top 100 greatest films of all time list. Mm-hmm. Um, we ping pong back and forth between the top of the list. Jackie's like <laughs> laughing right now because I told her I wasn't going to use the word ping pong anymore. <laughs> But guess what? It's, it's come okay. back. Who cares? It's, it's really like the best way to describe yeah. what we're doing because we do a film from the top and then the next film is from the bottom and we go back and forth working our way towards the middle of the mm-hmm. list. So mm-hmm. we're going to end on some really juicy. I know. Those ones are really, really good. Yeah. So this week we're at number eight, which is 1929's Man with a Movie Camera by Ziga Vertov. So Jackie, what have you been watching this last week? Not that much, but I did see the Joel Cohen Macbeth, and it was really, really good. I feel like people aren't talking about it enough. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. It's beautiful. It's because I don't have like, Apple. T- I don't have Apple TV. Ah, uh, yeah, it was out in theaters, and I really, really, really wanted to see it in theaters, but it just never happened. So I finally sat down and watched it on my computer. But it was still incredible. It was a sight to behold. It truly was. It was. It looks stunning. Stunning. So stunning. Yeah. The shadows, the light, it's really something very, very special. And I feel like people slept on it and they're going to continue sleeping on it for the next five years. And then maybe like in 10 years, people will realize, I think it's really incredible. Hmm. You know, I'm I'm always kind of skeptical about Shakespeare movies. I feel like that's one category of period piece I haven't really like dived into too much because I don't know, it's just I don't I don't know what it is exactly, but I I recently read Macbeth because I hadn't read it since high school and I love the Coen brothers, so I was very excited about this. So I read it in preparation for the movie. Wow. Yeah, so it was great. I bet and it read pretty just, quickly, right? Because it's a play. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then I, I, I did all that, and I still didn't see it in theaters. I <laughs> well, am the problem. I'm horrible. I, I hate a, myself. I think it had a very limited release, and it was like mid-Omicron, too. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Highly recommend. Nominated for a few Oscars this year. Not nearly enough as it should be, honestly, because one of my favorite movies of the year. Great. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. You want to know something funny? Hmm. When I was in eighth grade, I played Macbeth in the school play. You did? Yeah. I cannot imagine that. You're you're much too nice. <laughs> I was like the least threatening yeah. Macbeth that they've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's because it was in a, it was the third year that I was in and I worked my way up. So the first year I was Benvolio in Romeo and Juliet. Nice. And then I was Puck in a Midsummer Night's Dream. And then I think finally the teacher is like, okay, Greg, like you can have Macbeth. Because I was the only one that was like in every play, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> So I was Macbeth. So you know it really well. Yeah, I want to see it. What have you been watching? I saw two movies that <laughs> literally about to say tickled me. And that sounds so lame, but they did tickle me. So I'm just going to say it. I saw two movies back to back that just happened to be these kind of flights of fancy that very much tickled me. <laughs> So the first one I saw is a movie called The Incredible Shrinking Man from 1957, um, which Criterion just put out. And so it starts. So, yeah, it's a 1950s thing. And there's a lot about sort of like gender politics and stuff. And um, what's cool about it is the story is this guy. It's this married couple in the 50s. And the guy starts shrinking. He goes through this magic cloud and gradually starts. But it happens gradually. And like one day he's just like his shirt's a little loose. He's like, honey, what's going on here? And she's like, oh, I'm sure you're just losing some weight. And he keeps getting smaller and smaller until he's like he's like an inch tall. And what's really cool is the movie takes this premise, which is really ridiculous. It's based on a Richard Matheson story who wrote a bulk of like the Twilight Zone episodes and a lot of other stuff. Um it takes it really seriously 
And everything that would arise in that scenario is actually addressed in the movie. So like you see her knitting him like smaller clothes and stuff. It's like that logistical stuff that other movies would like gloss over that this movie actually pays a lot of attention to. And it takes it seriously. And it actually has this really existential ending, which I won't give away here if you haven't seen it, but it's a really smart, intelligent, just like, gripping little sci-fi movie that's so cool. and the whole back half of the movie is him shrunken down in his basement and his wife thinks he's dead and it's about just him surviving and there's this big spider that lives at the top of this like dresser and he there's like a piece of cheese and he needs to like fashion a, a grappling hook to go up there with so he takes like a sewing needle and like bends it in a hole in the wall and ties some thread around it and throws it up and it's just going up <laughs> one drawer at a time and then the spider's up there and he like gets knocked down. And then he has to like go back up and then he has to like fight the spider. Cool. It's like borrowers. It's so cool. It totally has like a borrowers vibe. I, I love that kind of stuff. I guess that's like a genre that I love. Studio Ghibli also has a movie called um, The Secret World of Arietti, which yeah. is based it's on the borrowers. borrowers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love that stuff. So this was really good. Honestly, really blew me away. Smart, nuanced, like emotionally intelligent movie. And then I saw a movie called Journey to the Beginning of Time. Which is made by a guy named Carol Zeman, Zeman, um, who's this, I believe, Czech animator. And he's kind of famous for, actually Criterion also has a box set out of his stuff. He's famous for a movie called Invention for Destruction. And even more famous for a movie called The Fabulous, or The Adventures of Fabulous Baron Munchausen or something like that. Um, But he's this animator And essentially, this movie is the story of this group of young boys, and they're, like, going through school textbooks and stuff, and one of them finds, like, a trilobite, like, fossilized, and they're like, hmm. And they basically get on this boat, and they go back in time, and it's just so enchanting. I fucking loved it. Um, You know, first they see, like, a woolly mammoth, and then they see, like there's just there's different like priests eventually they see like dinosaurs and then eventually they go back past the dinosaurs and it's just like bubbling earth and like stuff swimming around in the water and it's just so enchanting and guaranteed that wes anderson has seen and like worships these movies because the way there's a lot of like stop motion animation Mm -hmm. and stuff and the way it's done is very kind of like twee and whimsical and there's no way that wes anderson has not seen carol zemont's movies and been like yes because it's that's that's it Mm -hmm. like wes anderson is him and it's jacques tati and it's a couple other people rolled into one and that's wes anderson but (laughs) not to diminish what he does but this was so enchanting and just great and in the story of just like that boy's adventure like these boys are going back in time Mm -hmm. they're gonna see history it was just enchanting and i loved every second of it so seeing those two movies these sort of whimsical fanciful movies was i was in heaven (laughs) i like i watched them basically back to back i think i saw one one day and the next one the next day but i was so swept away by both of these movies i could not recommend them higher enough wow they were so good (laughs) wow yeah i want to i want to watch the shrinking man sounds so interesting because of like what we said i know i feel like i've grown up with this borrowers kind of i love like small things i love like I don't know. I even loved my Barbie's little household items because I just thought it was so cool that they were like tiny. And I love that logistical stuff. Like that sounds. And it it goes deep about it too, because the guy can no longer like provide for his wife. Right. And And what is that saying about gender? Yeah. It's the fifties. And it's that whole stereotype. Like they don't have kids, but it's like, now they never can. Yeah. <laughs> like the only, the next step I needed them to take, but they couldn't because it was the fifties is like some kind of like sex. Se- like they can't sleep together anymore. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. if they had gone there, it would have been like, oh. cool. <laughs> so a little bit of housekeeping. We just wanted to let you guys know that if you want to keep up with us and follow what's going on with the podcast or get in touch with us, yeah, drop us a line. Yeah. We are the official podcast of the Arroyo film club. So everything seen and heard related uh, would be posted on the Arroyo Film Club's Instagram. So it's just at Arroyo Film Club. A-R-R-O-Y-O Film Club on Instagram. Uh, It's something I run. I've been running for a little over a year now. It's a weekly film club where we meet on Zoom once a week on Thursday evenings. And we have a film of the week. And everyone gets a week to watch it. And then we convene Thursday evenings and we talk about the movie. 
it's fun. It's it's we have a blast. Very fun. We get people from all over the country, all, all over the world sometimes. Uh and it's just, we have a good time. So if you're if you are interested or you just want to drop us a line about seen and heard or see seen and heard stuff, you can find us at the Arroyo Film Club Instagram. Yes. With all right. that said, should we get into yes. this week's movie? I'm really excited about this one. Let's do it. Man with a Movie Camera is a silent documentary from the Soviet Union released in 1929. It is directed by Ziga Vertov, cinematography by Mikhail Kaufman, who stars as the eponymous man with the movie camera. He also happens to be Vertov's brother, and it's edited by Elizaveta Svilova, who is the director's wife, and she also appears in the film Hard at Work in Her Cutting Room. It's an experimental film told in montage depicting a day in the life of the proletariat in several then-Soviet cities, including Moscow, Kiev, and Odessa. Did you have another one? Kharkiv. Really? That one didn't come up. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, using incredible revolutionary camera tricks, including stop motion, double exposure, split screen, slow motion... It's an avant-garde dedication to life itself and the magical way we can use motion pictures as a way of capturing its beauty. So the specs and the director background are really important to understanding this film, I feel like. So this is going to... I apologize if this is a little excessive, but essentially Vertov... I mean, he okay, he was born David Kaufman. He changed his name and his name roughly translates to spinning top. And I think that's just so cool. It just shows his persona as a director. And he worked as a newsreel editor, which naturally translated over to making full-length documentaries. Uh, Svilova and Kaufman, his wife and brother, and him started the Kinok movement, which mm-hmm. is like Kino and then Ok, I guess, is like eyes. Yeah, it so means it's cinema like eyes. Cinema eyes. Mm-hmm. It was kind of a manifesto. Almost yes. think like Dogma 95. It's really yeah. interesting. So they basically vowed to only make documentaries and to preserve and expand the art. And everything was just grounded in truth. And they were really against fiction films, actually. They, <laughs> yeah. they really didn't like them. Which is funny because he grew up writing fiction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They published manifestos. They started a series known as Kino Pravda, which was 23. It's a series of 23 newsreel documentary type things, right? Um, yeah. And the the making of this movie, basically, it, it comes down to filmmakers back then had to basically compete with each other in the Soviet Union, make their case to several state sponsored studios as to why they should be granted the funds to make a movie. And towards the end of the 20s, Soviet films were leaning more towards like socialist realism. Like he's basically competing with uh, Battleship Patinkin and like that type, you know. Mm -hmm. So and he's obviously very Mm avant-garde. So there really wasn't room for him anymore. So he got knocked from the main studio. And so he went to and he went and found a Ukrainian studio. So the film, that's why a lot of the film takes place in Ukraine. Yeah, and Boris Kaufman, this is just a fun fact, his other brother went on to become an Oscar winning or nominated cinematographer. Legendary. Yeah, le- on the waterfront, 12 Angry Men. Yeah. So they're yeah. very they're a very cinematic family. And yeah, this is number 8 on the list. They were like the Coppolas of their generation. Yes. <laughs> and it is considered it's number one so sight and sound has a list of the best documentaries this is number one yeah because it's the first one on the list that is a documentary yeah yeah yeah. and uh it was shot over the span of three years yes Mm -hmm. and then my last big note is just the so when you start watching it it says music by alloy alloy orchestra yes let's talk about that so what that is basically because i was very confused in 1995 a man with a movie camera was chosen for a silent film festival and basically, this Alloy Orchestra is there. They were based. I don't think they're together anymore. But they were based. In I think they are actually. Really? I think so. 
Anyway, <laughs> you're from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I think their specialty is really like scoring silent films. So they created this score based on his original instructions. Yes. yes. And what a score. Like, well, I just can't imagine this movie without that score. Yes and no. What? Last week we did Intolerance. We talked about Carl Davis's score for that film and how great the movie was because of that score. I think in this instance, the Ally Orchestra uses too much synthesizer in their score. And I feel like it dates it. And it does feel like a very 1995 score. And I do think Interesting. there's something about silent film where like I want to hear either an organ or I want to hear like strings. Like I don't want to hear or I want to hear some like experimental rock. Like and that that's been cool too for silent film. But like I felt like this was I liked the music, but I think i wish it didn't use so much synthesizer really? and I, I did look up there have been like 20 scores for this movie mm-hmm. one of them is from 2002 by a composer named michael nyman who does like peter greenaway's scores and jane campion scores like he did the piano okay and i'd be very curious to hear his score instead of the Ooh. ally orchestras but no what, what did so you love the ally orchestra I, score? well that's getting into my initial thoughts yeah but well do you yeah. have more specs um no i think that does it for specs so yeah, let's 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 go into your initial thoughts and include your thoughts on the Ally Orchestra, please. Well, I had just heard all my life like this is a homework movie, and I obviously didn't go to film school, so I've never seen it. I'm it telling. has never been assigned to me. But you know, you know what you think when you're about to watch one of these movies. You think that you're not gonna connect with it that much, or it's gonna be like okay, it's a one and done. So that's kind of where I was when I sat down to watch it. And I loved it. I actually loved it. I was so surprised. I truly was. I wasn't expecting it. And yeah, I I love the music, Greg. I <laughs> it blew me away. Yeah. I I I noticed the synthesizer. So I didn't really I didn't realize that this score was only written in 1995. Yeah, it sounds like the 80s. A little bit, but also it was I thought it was fascinating. I thought it was really cool. The synthesizers. I don't know why I'm hung up on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised. I, but I am a little bit. A I'm little surprised. bit. Like, I don't hate the score. But anyway, sorry, continue. Yeah, and, and like I mentioned before, this is kind of weird timing. I mean, there's the tragic... There's the tragedy in Ukraine right now. Yeah. This horrible war. And I think that this movie is just... I mean, the way that it lined up is kind of crazy. And also, it's just one example of... And an example in the arts of how connected Russia and Ukraine are. And it's mm-hmm. it's really, it makes everything so much sadder. It does. Truly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those were like my initial thoughts. So you loved it. I really You were on really cloud loved nine. It. I, ha- I even texted you while I was watching it. I was like, uh, this movie's rad. You're like, like, this is really something. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me your initial thoughts. So this was, I did see this in film school for the first time. I think because it wasn't assigned to me. Well, it kind of is assigned oh, to me because yeah. I'm doing this podcast. Yeah. But anyway, go <laughs> There's ahead. no way around it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I like this. So this is my second time seeing it last night. Um, The first time I saw it, I liked it. The second time I saw it, I liked it. I don't think I love it as much as you do just because I think this laid the groundwork. First of all, I realized that this is such a key film in cinema history because what Vertov was doing here was opening so many doors and you see the way that he shoots so much of this stuff, like this stuff is still being, these techniques are still being used now. Yeah. But for my money, I will take, again, it's not fair to do this because it came like 60 years later, but I will take the, the, uh, like Koyana Skatsi and, and the sequel. Those are much more my kind of, but also, why do I need to compare them? I really like this movie. No, I think it's really good. And it's arresting. And the fact that it's like 65 minutes long. It's pretty great. I don't have anything negative to say about the movie. <laughs> except that I don't feel this really strong connection to it. It's, I, not, it's not a homework movie for right. me. But I don't like leave it being like, oh, like I'm elated right now. Okay, the word <laughs> on my lips when it ended and in my mind, not on my lips. I didn't say it out loud. You did Imagine say it out loud. I'm, I'm like sitting Kane alone. at the end yes. of Citizen Kane. <laughs> I'm sitting alone watching this and I just, it, it comes out of me. The word kinetic. Absolutely it's kinetic. A kinetic energizing yes. movie and it inspired me like it made me want to go out on the street and just 
record shit. Yeah. It really did. Yeah. Well, to think about when this was made, too. And I think, like, have you seen Koyana Skatsi? I haven't. You know what it comes down to for me? It's the score. Silent films live and die by the score. And again, I didn't dislike the score. But for me, again, it's not fair because this movie came out in the early 80s. But Philip Glass's score for Koyana Skatsi, or just the Katsi movies in general, is so flipping good. Like, I'm a huge Philip Glass fan. So much so that I try. I dragged my fiance to one of his operas, uh, Satyagraha, which was so good. And she was just like in misery the whole time. <laughs> no. I'm a huge Philip Glass fan. So for me, just the fact that, because again, this, that, those movies made by this monk, Godfrey Reggio, and they have this very spiritual. So think of, think man with a movie camera, but more sort of spiritual and mm-hmm. kind of like, ah. Uh, I really like this. I don't love it. But also, who the fuck am I? <laughs> Here's my thing. So, I like, sometimes I try, I ask myself, like, I try to describe and say out loud, like, why I love movies. And I kind of talked about this a little bit in Vagabond, I feel like. It's it's just like, I always return to this idea of the power of simply like recording something, making it alive, Mm -hmm. seeing it move, it just grants like importance and meaning and I can't describe it. And I feel like this, this, that's this movie. What's so cool about this movie too is it's people going about their lives. That's what I'm saying. It, 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 It just grants and all movies do this just by simply recording someone do something. It could be the most mundane thing but it just gives empathy and that's all like for example, Roma, that's Roma. Like, yeah, and, but with professional actors, but yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but still, yeah, I think I just, that was in my mind when mm-hmm. it ended. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. When this movie came out, so I think, for, first of all, Vertov, you were talking about earlier how he didn't like fiction and he had this sort of dogma uh, called uh, Kinox. But he literally called fiction, in quotes, the new opiate of the masses, wow. which is fucking hilarious. People today that are outraged about Scorsese talking shit about Marvel. Imagine being That's around him, in, yeah. in 1929 <laughs> when Ziga Vertov said fiction is the opiate How of the masses. funny. Okay, so uh, this might be a good time to read. I just want to read like the credo at the beginning of the movie. Oh, yeah. Can yeah, I yeah. read it? Yeah. Because I loved it. I saw it and I, was, I loved it. Yeah. Okay, so here's what it says. <clears throat> The film Man with a Movie Camera represents an experimentation in the cinematic communication of visual phenomena without the use of inner titles, without the help of a scenario, without the help of theater. This new experimentation work by Kino I is directed towards the creation of an authentically international absolute language of cinema on the basis of its complete separation from the language of theater and literature. I read that yeah. and I was like, this is Brayson. Like, yeah. it is straight up. Yeah. That's his MO. That's Brayson's MO is like cinema or as he liked to call it, there's a difference between like film and cinematography and cinematography is completely independent of literature and uh, fiction. Yeah. And I'm sorry, like theater. Right, right, right. He called everything else filmed theater. Like his movies were different. <laughs> Cinematography movies are different from filmed theater. That's what he was saying. Honestly, a little elitist. Sounds a it's little pretentious. A little, no, it is, but it's also so cool. It's I cool. think it's really cool. I both admire and detest yes. him a little bit. Who, <laughs> Simultan- no, no, no. Vertov. Yeah. So this was a response to his previous film, which he made in 1926, which was called A Sixth Part of A Sixth Part of the World which was kind of a travelogue that used inner titles and stuff that wasn't very well received. So this movie was kind of a response to that. Yeah. Although in the version I saw, there's no inner titles, but there are a couple subtitles that like give you the names of signs yeah, or buildings. Yeah, translation. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I feel like he still could have made that a little clearer. But <laughs> um, yeah, so this film is presented like in six acts, mm-hmm. which are like basically they're a real each. Right. Which is cool. Yes. That's super cool. And it's like these kind of six chapters. Yeah. But it's a day in the life. But it's also this like bigger picture thing because, mm-hmm. okay, it starts with sleep and a bunch of different people sleeping in the ways that they do. And actually, 
the woman that's asleep, that's staged, obviously. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because he like, broke oh, his I own hate rule. Fiction. Yeah. Anyway, there's a couple, a couple moments. There's a couple in this movie. stage stuff. Yeah. That's the big one. I feel like, I but I love it because it's, it's like okay. Do you remember this moment? This is one of my favorite moments. It's the shutters and her eyes. She's rubbing her eyes. She's trying to like wake up, kind of. Yeah. And then the shutters are opening and closing, uh -huh. and then there's a camera and the aperture closes, and then it reopens, and it's like he's doing so much there. He's doing. He's using this cinema language, like having just the shutters and her eyes would have been enough. But then the fact that he brings in the camera and uses the camera's aperture as a symbol as well, it's just ultimate, like, he's, I don't know, it's ultimately there, yeah. cinematic. Yes. <laughs> Does that make sense? Absolutely. It's meshing, it's this idea of his of meshing the eye and the camera and... It's so brilliant. I think it's really brilliant. You know what's funny? It's Eisenstein who did Battleship Potemkin. Yes. Do you know what he said about this movie? No! What did he say? <laughs> he called it, in quotes, pointless camera hooliganism. No! <laughs> because Vertov had previously said some unkind things mm. about Battleship Potemkin. But this was not... Eisenstein was not down That's with That's really funny. <laughs> in fact, you know what? When this came out, a lot of people dismissed it as being... Like, like this, funny. No, kind of. like annoying to mm -hmm. like because it's so clearly this like it's avant garde influences it wears on its sleeve. And I think a lot of people were just annoyed by it. And like, who the fuck is this guy? And I think <laughs> that was kind of the vibe when it came out. That's so funny. I mean, yeah, yeah he started his own movement with his wife and his brother. <laughs> like they just yeah. called themselves this. Not to say you, know, you can't do that. Right. But. No, of course not. <laughs> and then yeah, so that's like kind of the first sequence, right? And then it's work and it's machinery and it's yeah. very much like He's, obsessed. He's and, obsessed with machinery. Yeah. So that all plays into his sort of like Marxist ideology exactly. that he has over yes. this movie of like the things of the time that are that he's using to tell this exactly. story with. Yeah. And then after that, the next, I don't know exactly what reel this was on, but that's when it gets into kind of big picture. There's people that go to, I don't know, City Hall and they, they get um a license for they get a marriage license wedding oh, yeah, registry yeah. and the music is well, so funny let's not talk about that right now that's all i'm gonna say about that oh shit <laughs> oh shit so there's wedding registry and yes. then there's divorce re registry uh -huh. and then what i imagine is like a death certificate and then we follow this funeral procession uh -huh. and then you see this woman in pain and you don't know what the fuck is going on and then she gives birth. Yes. Live birth. Yes. I don't think that was the first time that was shown on film. But It's the oldest I've ever seen it. Yeah. But it's crazy. Your jaw didn't drop when you saw that? Um, no. Wow. <laughs> you know what's funny? <laughs> While I was watching this movie, I forgot it was from 1929. This is literally like sound film existed at mm -hmm, this point. Like mm -hmm. The jazz singer had come mm -hmm. out. This actually feels like earlier mm -hmm. and if this had been like 1919 i would have been like oh boy but by 1929 we'd had we'd had these silent these great silent films i'm not trying to take anything away from this movie but i feel like in my head this was an earlier movie than it actually right, was right um i do know too that with this movie vertov promised to in quotes explode arts tower of babel babylon which intolerance is, yeah. <laughs> It's a very grand statement to make about this movie. You know, look, on one hand, I like really respect what he did here. And obviously it's seminal and it's important. But the, I feel like if I knew him in real life, I'd probably hate him. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. And then, okay, so after that is like my favorite part where it's it's like people using tools and someone's getting their nails done. It's all the little tools. Yes. And someone's having a shave. And then there's the great part of this woman constructing cigarette boxes. Mm -hmm. And she's using this pole. So it's like yes. humans using tools. And I love things you can touch. I love like tactile. It goes back things. to 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yes. It goes back to these things and objects. I love working with my hands. Like I said, I loved like little Barbie, like small little accessories they had. <laughs> I love things you can touch and uh -huh. you can reach out and they yeah. are physically there. And yeah, yeah. The, you were talking about the woman getting her nails done and that's intercut with like uh, his wife editing the film which is also cut together with like this woman sewing yes yes it's beautiful so he's, he's really driving it home but i mean he's it works it i works. love it yeah and 
Yeah, and then after that, we just have like leisure, people working out, people at the doing beach, sports. naked, topless. Yeah, and those great dissolves into the beach where it's like no one there, and then they yeah. come in. It's I like it. What are those people being rubbed down with? <laughs> mud. Yeah, I guess. How was that fun? Mud baths. You haven't heard of mud baths? Yeah, but to do it in public, like at the beach in front of everyone, and just be covered with mud. I don't know. That's not a fun time to me. I, I my sister. Have you had a mud bath before? No. I haven't either. It sounds like my worst nightmare. My sister I had one. Like it. She said it was terrible. And she started like like sinking <laughs> sl- sinking into it and Quick like sand. and it was like really thick and she said it smelled bad like sulfur and stuff. Ew. And I was like, yeah, I'm never going to do that. No, I would never. That sounds uncomfortable. Anyway, yes, leisure. <laughs> leisure, yeah, and then there's the bar. There's that fun shooting game, the bar and the famous yes. the scene of the cameraman in the glass of beer. Yeah. So it's like they're having fun with it. It's it's yeah. the mundane stuff, but that's what I love about this movie. It has fun with it and I don't know, it could just be renamed Things Humans Do. Like it really can. <laughs> Well, there there is such a focus on the eponymous man with the movie camera, which is played by so, his brother. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about that because I had forgotten. Maybe this is a huge. I saw this for the first time maybe five or six years ago. I had forgotten uh, in my head this movie was just the images, and you didn't see this guy cranking a camera every few minutes. Not that I have a problem with it, because it does help sell the whole idea. I think, and the fact that even though it's. I didn't know while I was watching the movie that that wasn't him. I oh, thought that was him. Yeah. Did you know? I didn't know, but I don't. I don't think I even assumed it was him for some reason. Oh, I definitely assumed because it was no, him. in the title cards it says cameraman. It says like notes oh, from a yeah. cameraman's journal or something. I don't know. Yeah. But an interesting choice, and there was um, yeah, like you're talking about with the beer mug and. There's a lot of crazy stop motion too that happens with like the camera oh, tripod and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's just having a good time. It, you know what this movie is? It's just someone exploring the possibilities, uh, the possibilities of cinema. Yes. Like, and I love it for that. While it also it drives yeah. home this idea, their entire religion, it seemed like almost they were obsessed with this is capturing what the eye sees, capturing it with a camera. And this movie is really about filmmaking. It's It's a very, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's a, it's a meta experiment. It's like, let's show people how the film is made in the film and have this framing device of an audience watching the film with that we're making that like come down on, yeah. with the string it's self ending <laughs> yeah. with the camera and the eye closing like it's very meta yeah 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 and although again not the first to do that right but uh, here's the thing i'm weary of giving this movie too much credit because this is 1929 cinema has been around for 30 plus years at this point i'm just this has a lot going for it, but it's. I don't think it's this be all end all. Like everything came from this. I'm not saying it is. No, no, no. I'm not saying you're saying that either. I just want to make it clear to people listening. You're saying people think it is. No, I'm not even saying that. I'm just saying that I think it's it's important to make a distinction. Like Buster Keaton had done Sherlock Jr. Like we've already had that framing device of people sitting in a theater and like this sort of meta thing. So I don't want to get, I don't want to sing the movie's praises too much in terms of it being so cutting edge. Right. Right. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. I don't know why I'm like trying to bring this down. I don't don't know why I'm like out for it. And I like like the movies. Yeah. But yeah. And you know, they're like putting themselves in danger doing these camera experiments. Obviously Buster Keaton is the king of that, but I'm just saying and they're having fun with it because there's that great part where he's setting up the camera on train tracks and then it's intercutting with the woman who's having a nightmare. Yeah, and there's that's sound, cool. And it seems like he got hit by the train. That's really cool. Like, I like they're that. they're just fucking around. What about that one where the dog gets its leash tied around the guy's leg and starts dragging him down that like icy slope? Like I was like, what the Why f-? do I not remember that? Oh, because it wasn't in the movie. <laughs> Wait, really? Yeah. <laughs> wow um but no the like okay what i love is that tracking shot so yes you see the cameraman and and then you see the cameraman's pov so you see him he's obviously being shot yeah. and then you see what he's shooting yeah and there's that great tracking shot where they're on they're in a car and they're following this family on an open car and the woman's imitating him. She's looking at him, uh-huh. like imitating him rolling. The, cranking. Yeah, yeah, cranking the camera. It's so funny. It's so, 
I loved that. Yeah, we get back to that in a second too. Yes, interesting. Um, I wonder why. Yeah, the whole movie he doesn't let you forget that you're watching a film and let you forget that the movie's being pieced together as you're watching it. Yeah, let's talk about the editing. Yeah. I love those match cuts where oh, yeah. you're seeing a photo of the kids and then it's her in the cutting or it just starts to move. I don't remember. It's her in the cutting room and then you see the photo and then it comes to life and it's so yeah. I don't know. This is this is like their thesis, I feel like. This is Yes, exactly. That's perfect. So, that's the perfect word for it. Yeah. So you have to take it as that. And it's like, I'm on board, but nothing came after this really. Nothing that I know of. Maybe I have to watch those 23 newsreels, but nothing came after this that was very I don't know. Is because I know he has one movie, I think it's called something about Lenin. Um and I'd be curious to see it. Because it feels like he's establishing a school of thought and he's established the school of thought. But then... So there was a movie, because this shot from 1926 to 1929 and mm-hmm. it was released in 1929. Mm-hmm. In 1927, a movie cal- came out called Berlin, Symphony of a Great City, directed by Walter Ruttman, oh. which is kind of doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. But in Berlin, mm-hmm. two years before this came out, they questioned him about it. Like, oh, this was kind of already done. And he was like, oh, yeah, but... If you look at my old newsreels, you can tell I, I was there before that guy was there. Wow. So he's kind of petty. Yeah. I just feel like if I knew Vertov in real life, <laughs> I would hate it. He'd be a little twerp. Maybe. <laughs> oh, the last like meta camera thing I really liked was the shot of the camera in the sky. Like it's placed on a ledge. Yes. How cool was yeah, that? That's super cool. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, should we do sight and sound? I think you were dying to. Yeah. Well, Okay. <laughs> I'll say my favorite site. I'm just going to jump right in. Okay. Going on the shot where they are doing that tracking shot of this these people in a car. Mm-hmm. My favorite site of the movie is just seeing him standing on the frame of the car while it's moving, cranking the camera to get that shot. Mm-hmm. Because you could get seriously hurt doing that. Yeah. Like if one gust of wind or something, he falls backward, he's going to crack his head on the, the road and yeah. possibly die. Like, Oh, yeah. It's just... Thinking about what it took to get some of the shots of this movie. Definitely. Um, so yeah, just for that for that alone, it was like, look, you know. It, Kudos. Yeah. Um, Although it was actually his brother. My <laughs> my favorite sight. So I have two. Typical. I know. <laughs> One of them is very low key. It's just the shadow. There's this doorway that he goes in and out of a lot. I think he goes in the beginning and then it reappears and there's this shadow on the floor of a very ornate French door. Do you yes, know what I'm talking I about? I do. Uh-huh. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And then my other favorite sight is the shot of balloons, like in the wind, kind of. Mm-hmm. I'm a sucker for balloons. I don't know why. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I really like balloons. <laughs> I love movies about balloons. Uh <sighs> What's it called? The Red Balloon? The Red Balloon. The, I think there's Up. another one called The White Balloon. There's this Iranian movie. I think it's called The White Balloon. Oh. But it's about a goldfish, which is why I'm... Co- oh, yes. Now I remember it. It is called The White Balloon. Oh, yes. I haven't seen it. It's cute. And up, yeah. Up, I don't yeah. know. I like balloons. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Those are my favorite sights. What about sound? It okay. sounds like we might have, the same, we have the same one. one. My favorite sound was... Favorite. So, in that divorce scene you were talking about. So, they're getting... There's two people signing a marriage certificate, and it's Here Comes the Bride, played by the Ally Orchestra. And then the divorce segment, it's like played at like a minor key. Is that your favorite? Is that your favorite sound too? Of course it is. Yeah, why is it so ominous? ominous? Yeah, oh my Honestly, God, for geez. a lot of people, divorce is like a great thing. So why, you know, <laughs> maybe they're getting their lives back. Perhaps. Okay, so, so since we tied, then let me, not tied, but we had the same one. Let me show the other sound, which was tied for me, because that was number one. And All number right. two was, I love the sound when the chairs go down. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's I love so that too. fun. I love the music. 
music. I think it's so fun. I know. I hate. I don't dislike it. I don't know. What does Pauline say? Pauline didn't say anything no. about this movie that I could find. Shit. I'm surprised. I think, too, this movie didn't really like it. I think it was in 1995 when it yeah, kind of resurfaced and the Alloy Orchestra did their thing. I think for a long time it was hard to find a print of this mm-hmm. because when you watch the version now, there's a whole disclaimer about he brought a print to like Amsterdam or something. Yeah. And it, it sat there for a long yeah. time. It's the, like the last surviving complete print. Yeah. So I think it was kind of hard to see for a while. Yeah. But so no Pauline Kale mm. segment for this episode. Okay. But we do have our trusty letterbox. Let's read some letterbox reviews. I have one half a star. Why did I just watch an episode of How It's Made? <laughs> That's so good. That's so funny. Okay. One and a half stars. Forgive me, Letterboxd, for I have sinned. Man <laughs> with a Movie Camera is no doubt a groundbreaking feat for the documentary genre through the stripping of a conventional narrative and utilizing natural elements to evoke emotion and poetic imagery. But it rarely left me captivated with what was delivered on screen. Finding cohesion in themes, but lack the power to surge them. Hmm. I was left as a passive viewer throughout, constantly hoping for something to capture my attention. I've prepared myself for the infinite lashes that is is surely <laughs> going to come my way. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that on Letterboxd. Someone gave it half a star and just said, yeah, yeah, I'm sure it was great for the time or whatever. <laughs> uh, this is a three and a half star review, but it's really funny. Time capsule of a world where electric guitars, slinkies, LSD, antibiotics, bikinis, and Xanax didn't exist, yet people somehow managed to smile. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Another half a star. This one might be my favorite. If I wanted to see someone jerk themselves off for an hour and 29 minutes, I would just watch porn. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, this one I really don't agree with, but I feel like you're going to agree with it. Uh-oh. Two stars. If a film bro were a film, it would be this film. Mm. No, right? No, I don't know. No. no. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Maybe this is a movie that a film bro would say is their favorite movie. Favorite documentary ever. Yo, but have you seen Man with a Movie Camera? Yeah, okay, we just made fun of a film bro saying it's his favorite documentary ever, but it's Sight and Sound's number one documentary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> star and a half while people like chris marker may not have gotten the whole moving images memo i feel like ziga vertov took that memo plainly and just rolled with it (laughs) chris marker famous for his still image films like uh la jete you seen it i don't know i wonder but it's been on my list i think it's on the it's on the list yeah Two and a half stars. I know this was a revolutionary movie and very experimental, but I just don't like this type of movies at all. There is no plot, no dialogue, and I really couldn't get into it, but I still find some of it interesting, and it's obviously very important film for cinema. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was just like a plain it's just bad, genuine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was star and a half, and it said, Vertov really do be out here making the 1920s equivalent to a Vine compilation. <laughs> Also, who's, who's even talking about Vine now? Oh, my God. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, sure, you can absolutely trace Vine back to Man sure, with a Movie Camera. Sure, Okay, ready? I love this one. Two and a half stars. I understand that it's a good film, but it's also almost the film equivalent of this could have been an email. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> but it really couldn't have been. <laughs> no way! Someone gave it a star and a half and just said, this is a tech demo. <laughs> That's what you were saying before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was Man with a Movie Camera. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, if you haven't seen silent film, this might not be the best one to start with. But it's a it's a great film, and I think it's very approachable. And I think it's very... it's a, Look, it's an important, seminal movie. And yeah, I mean, we didn't even talk that much about all the, like fun little tricks he does but it is a very uh, yeah oh, you know, ma- like, match cuts what you were saying and double exposure double exposures and, and tilting the camera in weird ways and yeah and that i love that stop motion animation at the end yeah, where the tripod motion, yeah. just the camera like takes a life of its own it's and, so playful yeah, yeah. 
Which is why I'm glad he didn't include anything like too serious or somber in this movie. Exactly. Because it is playful. It's just life. I didn't want to see people dead in the streets or something. People doing things. Yeah. Well. I think that about covers it. I think that covers it. Thanks for joining us this week. You guys should come back next week because we're doing another silent film. This one even shorter than this. It's Unchain Andalou by Luis Benuel and Salvador Dali. Join us. It's only 15 minutes. Yeah, something like that. 15, 20 minutes. I May- wonder how long the episode will be. Well, let's see. <laughs> You'll have to tune in next week to You find will out. have to tune in. So. <sighs> I hope you enjoyed our tongue twister. Yeah, we, we spent a good uh, <laughs> 20 minutes before working that out. <laughs> so, please. It's yours. It's the world's to enjoy mm-hmm. for the rest of time. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. please. Mm-hmm. I guess that about wraps it up. Thank you for listening. Bye, guys. Bye. Seen and Heard is presented by the Arroyo Film Club. Produced by and starring Greg Kleinschmidt and Jacqueline Pistachian. Edited by Greg Kleinschmidt. Music by Andrew Cox. Special thanks to Catherine Farinchak. <laughs>